Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Donna Lynn Hilton. I'm the artistic director here at Goodspeed Musicals, and I'm honored to be able to welcome you all here this afternoon. Um, behind me are the leaders of many of the arts organizations um, in our region of the state, which have been um, so severely impacted by the pandemic. And I'm really honored to welcome them. And I want to take a minute to acknowledge their sacrifice and the sacrifice of their staffs. This has been an unprecedented time for so many of us, and the arts industry has not been accepted from that. And I just want to say, I realize what you're going through, and thank you for everything. Um, Representative Courtney, we're really happy to have you with us today. Your leadership, not only in support of the Shuttered Venue Operators Grants Program, but of business and enterprise throughout our state is unfailing. And we are really honored that you've chosen Goodspeed as the site of today's press conference. So thank you for being with us. We're also glad to have with us Catherine Marks, District Administrator with the Small Business Administration. Catherine, thanks to you and the people at the SBA for your efforts on behalf of small businesses throughout our state and particularly at this critical time. Before I hand things off to Representative Courtney, I, let me offer you a little quick update on where things stand with Goodspeed Musicals in this moment. Um, in a normal season, Goodspeed would welcome over 100,000 theater patrons to enjoy productions here at the Goodspeed and at our Terrace Theater in Chester. Those patrons are the core of a $17.4 million economic impact that ripples, ripples out from Goodspeed and throughout the region annually. As we enter our second year of shutdown, we're faced here at Goodspeed with the loss of a total revenue of over $11 million. And that doesn't begin to address the human toll of this pandemic on our theater. Nearly 70% of our staff have been laid off or furloughed since last April. In addition, nearly 300 artists, artisans and technicians lost jobs, lost contracts with good speed due to the pandemic. With the help of two rounds of PPP funding, we've been able to maintain a small number of our staff, maintain health benefits for our furloughed employees, and maintain our historic home and our large campus here in East Haddam and the Terrace Theater in Chester. We've also benefited from generous support from our donors, but our ability to navigate reopening hinges on the Shuttered Venue operation, Operators Grant. We're anxiously awaiting the opening of the application portal tomorrow, and we look forward to beginning our return to work. We have a very long road to recovery ahead of us, but here at good speed, we are committed to reclaiming our position as an economic engine in the lower Connecticut River Valley. We thank you, Representative Courtney, for recognizing that our economic recovery that does not include the arts is not a full economic recovery. And we welcome you to East Haddam and to Goodspeed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donna, for your kind introduction and, um, and the opportunity to come to one of the most special places in the state of Connecticut, Goodspeed Opera House, uh, with a lot of your colleagues, again, who really have just done you know, heroic and magnificent work uh, in the, during the pandemic in terms of making sure that uh, one of the really essential parts of um, our country's life um, stays um, alive as we uh, hopefully get to the final backstretch of the, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, it's just a little bit over a year ago that the CARES Act which was Congress's first major uh, piece of legislation to respond to the, to the um, pandemic was enacted. And it was clear at that point that um, with almost a universal shutdown, that almost every sector of the U.S. economy was going to be adversely affected, except you know, with some very you know, small number of uh, you know, really critical essential services. Um, we now sort of have a year of um, experience to really sort of look a little closer about the way the pandemic's recession, sort of where it hit the hardest. And, and you know, there clearly were some sectors that were able to adjust and work remotely, you know, whether it was financial services, um, you know, other, um, you know, companies and, and, and businesses that really didn't require density of people to be together is a sort of critical uh, business model. Um, and then there were others uh, like, um, you know, the, the shuttered venues and restaurants and others that really um, took it on the chin the hardest and still to this day continue to struggle because we, again, haven't sort of gotten the all clear signal yet uh, with the vaccination effort. So as the Congress revisited COVID relief bills, um, and we did periodically, and then we went through sort of a dry spell. 
finally in December, I think there really was a little more precision in terms of you know, where the, the help was needed the most. And the Shuttered Venues Fund, $15 billion, was uh, included in the December, end of December COVID uh, relief bill. The rescue plan, which President Biden signed into law on March 11th, um, kind of topped off the, the total amount in the bill and also made some critical uh, adjustments to clarify, you know, what people's eligibility for shuttered venues would be if they already used the PPP program, which, uh, again, caused a lot of heartburn and we got a lot of those calls in my office. And I think at least now we've got sort of the lines clear in terms of just how this program can function, uh, again, as it goes live um, tomorrow. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, I, I just cannot say enough about the fact that the arts advocates here in the state of Connecticut, and Wendy Burry is here, who's probably the one we've dealt with the most in my office, has just been relentless in terms of making sure that people realize that, you know, the arts and culture, it's obviously so, necessary for our, you know, health, you know, written large to make sure that we, we you know, continue to nurture um, the arts community, but that it also is an economic pillar. And unfortunately, you know, we convince enough people to get this thing done, but there's still a lot more convincing to be done. So we, we really look forward um, as the program rolls out with our friends at the Small Business Administration, you know, to really be able to to demonstrate, you know, again, just how smart and focused the arts community is going to be by, give, by getting this opportunity to really be ready when the, you know, all clear signal comes, we can get together again and enjoy wonderful plays, you know, whether it's the Kate or whether it's here at Goodspeed or a whole other, you know, range of venues. Um, but again, I want to just say it would not, this would not have happened if it was not for the folks up here really, um, you know, exercise their rights to just, you know, create external pressure on Congress to, to really recognize something really serious is happening here to the arts community, and we've got to really pay attention to that, you know, or the damage will be really, it would take years and years to recover from. So congratulations to all of you, and congratulations to Catherine Marks, who's here from the Small Business Administration. I don't know what the order of speaking is here, whether it's... We'll have Catherine come up, who uh, is a good friend in Eastern Connecticut from Hebron. We've known each other for many, many years, and um, her office has been, you know, really one of the busiest congressional uh, governmental offices over the last year. So thank you for all your great work, Catherine. Thank you, Congressman Courtney. Um, and uh, to the Goodspeed and to the Kate and and um, to all the. To all the arts organizations, I think we can all say that the intermission's just been a little bit too long here, um, and we're ready to raise the curtain. Um, the SBA, we're, we're here to help um, help the hardest hit our, our arts organizations. And with that, um, Congress created the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant. The application um, will be open tomorrow, Thursday, April 8th. Um, this is a grant program first for the SBA, and we were very diligent in how we uh, formed the grant because we have so many entities to support. We have the live venue operators, the promoters, the theatrical producers, the live performing arts operators, the museum operators, the zoos, the aquariums, the motion picture theater operators, and talent representatives. That is a lot of groups um, to organize a grant around. Um, the SBA knows that these venues are critical to our economy um, and, and to our enjoyment of life here in Connecticut. Um, they've been impacted. They were the first to shutter just a year ago. Um, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant was established by the Economic Aid to, hard, to Small Economic Aid to hard hit small businesses, nonprofits, and venues act. That's quite a mouthful. And it was amended by the American Rescue Plan. Um, the program set aside six program set aside sixteen billion dollars in grants to shuttered venues and again is being um, administered by our Office of Disaster Assistance. The eligible applicants can apply for forty five percent 
of their gross earned revenue. Um, a maximum single grant is $10 million. I'm so happy that the Goodspeed applied for the PPP and received it. Um, that is a boost, uh, a shot in the arm, as they say, um, to, to get through some of these hard times. Um, $2 billion will be reserved for eligible applications for the smallest, for those with 50 full-time employees. Um, again, the portal opens on April 8th. It's a grant program um, to, to uh, for, and it will be first applications. It's a tiered basis to make sure that those that are hardest hit will be the first to get the grants. Um, again, you know, we built it from the ground up. We know our performing arts um, are ready to raise the curtain. And I'd like to give a special shout out to our resource partners here in Connecticut, the Small Business Development Center, the Women's Business Development Council. Um, they have helped make sure that our small, smallest theaters are ready to complete this very detailed grant application. So thank you, Congressman Courtney, for your support in Congress. Um, it's a pleasure to, to serve and I can't wait to um, enjoy some outdoor concerts um, here in the summer with you all. Thank you very much. Shall I introduce sure. Mr. Rob Smith, the first selectman of East Haddam? Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming today. This is really important. You know, we're standing in front of this building here almost 150 years old now. And 60 years ago, it was ready for the, be destroyed. And uh, it's now the iconic center of East Haddam in the village here. But it, it's more than just a building, it's all the people that work here. The many, many hundreds and thousands that do come here every year for these shows here and at the satellite facility down in Chester at Norma Terrace. But also the Cape and uh, Iverton Playhouse. They're all iconic and they're all part of the fabric of every town. So when I look at uh, this, not only do I see people coming back into town here for the shows, for all the uh, other activities that go along with it, but also for the restaurants. And as importantly, all the people that work here and at all the other venues. So this is an extremely important program. Uh, it's been, uh, I'm gonna say a long time in coming. And I wanna thank all these people back behind me for all their work and putting this together. And of course, Congress, Congressman Courtney and all the rest of the members of Congress. So thank you all again. This is so important for the town of East Adam. And of course, Essex and Iverton and Saberk and every other town that has one of these iconic venues. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Hubbard. I'm here representing the Iverton Playhouse, uh, which is a uh, theater that's been operating for over 90 years in the village of Iverton. And in fact, the only other time it's been closed in its history was during the Second World War. So this was a real shock to our system. Um, I th like the good speed in microcosm, we are the economic driver for the village of Ivoryton, the restaurants, the gallery, the pubs, and so all have suffered as you've heard this story over and over again during this pandemic. Um, but I want to talk about the things we kind of learned about it and the things that I'm grateful for. First of all, I'm so grateful to all of the people out there who stepped up when there was funding from the state of Connecticut. Our supporters rose up and uh, contributed funds to help get us through this time, which was so incredibly amazing. While they were struggling too, they were still helping us out. I'm so grateful to live in this state that does support the arts and is there for us in these hard times. And so grateful to Joe and the administration now for this shuttered venue grant that is gonna be such a boost to help us get through this and to make it into hopefully a brighter future. The, during the pandemic, during the worst days of it, we had an outdoor concert at the, the Ivoryton Playhouse. 
and you know it always seemed unseemly for the arts to be asking for money when there was so many death and illness and hospitalizations but i sat and did what i always do when there's ever a show i sit and watch the audience and i watch the tears and i watch the smiles and i saw the people's spirits just lifted by the music and each and every one of them when they left left said thank you thank you we miss this so much we need the music we need the stories back to give our lives some meaning so thank you so much and um fingers crossed we can all get moving very soon thank you Uh, good afternoon, I'm Brett Elliott, the Executive Director of the Kate in Old Saybrook. And I just want to thank Goodspeed for hosting today and for Representative Courtney for being here and uh, for his staff for putting this together. I want to share what I am focused on. Uh, and w that is, while there's no way to look at the last year without thinking about loss, the Kate is focused on the future. It's easy for me to rattle off a whole bunch of statistics about how our earned income is down 99.5% or the struggle to stay connected with our patrons when the one thing that we do, uh, bringing people together, just doesn't exist right now. Uh, we can lament about the harm that has been done to our industry um, or uh, the fact that artists just haven't been paid for the last year, and all of those things are really devastating. But a couple weekends ago, the last weekend of March, the Kate hosted its first live event with a band on stage uh, and an audience, a very small audience. Um, and it had been 379 days since we had done that, and it felt really amazing. Um, for an organization that previously did 275 events a year, it had been a really long time. We also learned that our audiences were ready to return. They were ready to return safely and play by new rules of the new normal. Um, and for the Kate, we showed signs of life, because no matter how many virtual events we did, uh, including a gala honoring share, they're not the same as bringing people together or being in person. The Shuttered uh, Venue Operators Grant will allow the Kate to safely supercharge this excitement and the connection to our patrons. Shows and events will begin to safely return, and this grant resource will allow us to make bold financial decisions after a year of only the basics or less. It will allow us to fully fulfill our mission again. Uh, this excitement and activity will not only be felt within the four walls of the Kate, but with significant residual impact on our community as a return of the Kate means a return of shops, restaurants, hotels, and other attractions in Saybrook. Uh, for the Kate, SVOG is a lifeline that allows us to move forward. It allows us to navigate the interim between uh, this current slow reopening to a return to capacity. Uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity to apply. It's been a little anxiety inducing over the last three and a half months waiting, but we realize the reward will far outweigh the challenges. Uh, we look forward to getting back to work. We look forward to welcoming our patrons back. We look forward to coming back even stronger. And so to the champions of the Save Our Stage Bill and SBOG, and to our Connecticut elected officials who have championed us through this, um, we just can't say thank you enough. Hi, I'm Wendy Berry. I'm the Executive Director of the Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition. Happy to be here. Thank you, Joe, for all of your work uh, to get all of this Moving forward, I know for me, just missing the live shows, that kind of moment when you get your ticket either by email or when you get it in the mail, uh, when you have dinner out with your friends or family before a show, you park in the garage, potentially in the city, pay some money there, but you're seeing and you're talking to your friends in the lobby of places like the Good Street Opera House. You're waiting for those lights to flicker and tell you it's time to get to your seats. And then when you get in there, you're shoulder to shoulder with family and friends in a crowd around you. And then the lights go out and the lights, I mean, sorry, the lights come on, the music comes on and the stage comes on. It is a, an experience unlike any other. And we love it and this community and communities need it. We have missed it so much. And our performing arts venues really are a still very long way away, not completely. I hear Brett and everybody else that we're getting ready. We're hearing lots of plans uh, for events that are on the calendar, a lot of outdoor events. But the reality is, is that getting back into those theaters shoulder to shoulder with our community is still quite a ways away. And it's going to depend on the SVOG grant to keep these organizations, protect them, give them the money that they need to survive and make it through this pandemic, and then wait until the audiences are ready to come back and be in that space. And that's going to be quite a while, and we understand that. But they need this lifeline. So thank you to Congressman Courtney for your part in making this happen and for all that you do to support arts and culture in Eastern Connecticut and abroad. Uh, because I'm always going to bring the data and the facts with me wherever I go, <laughs> um, pre-COVID, 
The arts and cultural sector in the United, in the United States is a $919 billion industry. It was 5.2 million jobs, and it was 4.3% of this nation's economy. Nationwide, we've lost $150 billion in lost revenue, and 2.7 million people have been made unemployed in the arts and cultural sector by COVID. Here in Connecticut alone, 2.4 billion in lost revenue for the creative economy just in 2020. 61% of creative businesses are severely impacted, and 33,000, over 33,000 creative workers were made unemployed. That's 56% of the creative workers that are unemployed through COVID. From a recent report that came out from the Office of Legislative uh, Research here in Connecticut, the year-over-year -year employment in the leisure and hospitality industry, sorry, which includes the arts and cultural sector, decreased to a level not seen over the last three decades. The steep increase in claims for unemployment, there was a 468% increase in claims for unemployment benefits in the arts, entertainment, and recreation sector. And there's a decrease of 20 million in sales and use tax collection. That's people spending their money when they're out buying a ticket to a show and having dinner at a restaurant. And because people come to Connecticut and travel here to see arts and culture, to see the venues, to see the shows, there is a 49% decline in the occupancy tax collection from last year. Which, just in case you didn't know, the hotel occupancy tax is what funds arts, culture, and tourism here in the state of Connecticut. So now we have a huge ripple effect in terms of funding support for the sector alone. So this source, this is a vital source, the SVOG is a vital source of funding to help save our stages, to help protect our performing arts organizations, and help our communities recover. The United States representatives, including Joe Courtney, have done their part to protect and support arts and culture, and we hope that our uh, communities will too, and I thank him for that. I will say uh, there's additional things that could be done. Uh, so with the American Rescue Plan, I know our organization, and even across the state, many of us have asked every municipality to dedicate 1% of their American Rescue Plan funds to support arts and culture in the local communities. So we have federal dollars, we have state dollars, and we need local dollars to support. This, this is not done through this grant alone. It's going to be a long haul. And in addition, we would hope that the governor continue, the administration continue to prioritize and really put forth a, a, a bigger effort towards prioritizing funding for the arts, culture, uh, industries that are not just at the hardest, but also the lifeblood of our community vitality. The industries that together feed uh, off of each other, feed our souls, feed our communities, the restaurants, hospitality, and arts and culture. And finally, my last piece, for those organizations who are eligible to apply, apply, apply tomorrow. We're here to help. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Congressman Courtney. I'm honored to be here with uh, all my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues. Uh, I'm Eric Dillner. I'm the CEO of the Shoreline Arts Alliance, as well as on the board of directors of the Connecticut Nonprofits as uh, one of the voices of, of the arts there. Additionally, I'm the uh, founder and chair of the task force to reopen Connecticut arts venues through science-based safety in conjunction with Yale School of Public Health. The shuttered venue program is important and, cr and crucial first step in bringing the arts community back to life in Connecticut uh, throughout and throughout the country. This funding demonstrates and recognizes that the arts are vital to our communities, our economy, and mental well-being of our citizenry. When COVID-19 struck our state, we knew we had to find a way to help the arts community survive. In March, Shoreline Arts Alliance approached Yale School of Public Health to do just that. We created a task force to reopen Connecticut arts venues through science-based safety. Our goal is to offer clarity, practical scientific advice, and help build consumer confidence through science-based safety. We offer employers and institutions information on how best to build a plan with and for their audience, visitors, staff, artists, and students. We help them to understand the essential elements needed for a plan and how will we, this will best protect themselves, their employees, and their audience. To date, these webinars have served over 12,000 people in over 15 states and four countries. We voluntarily traveled throughout the state to conduct numerous site visits, virtual site visits, and consultations. We've held site visits at many of your landmarks here in Connecticut, like Mark Twain House, New Haven Museum, the Connecticut College Arboretum, Ivoryton Playhouse, Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Arts, Historic Florence Griswold Museum, I could go on and on. Uh, we've also helped folks like the mayor of New London to look at their waterfront stages to figure out how they could use them better. And we've helped various dance companies of various different sizes, symphonies, 
the U.S. Coast Guard Band, which was my, one of my favorite ones, and so many more. Uh, and by, by teaching and working with community impact organizations such as the Arts Collective in Hartford, in the past year, like so many, I've learned a great deal about the resiliency of artists and arts leaders in this great state of Connecticut. The tenacity of arts leaders to work with us to develop strategic plans to reopen with prudence and science-based information has set the course so that they can be extraordinarily effective with the dollars that are coming to our state's arts and tourism drivers. This is an incredible opportunity that we are really ready for. We will now be focusing on some of the state's larger institutions to help them find the most cost-effective way to address, yes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but air handling strategies, staffing models, and other assistance with consumers' confidence. I knew nothing about air handling uh, a year ago, and now I feel like uh, you asked me a question, and I'll, I'll at least make something up for you. No, no, really, there's, there's a lot of really important things that we all, we all have, have had to learn through all of this. And air handling seems to be a big, big subject here. Um, it's very important for us to find a way to make sure that those dollars are spent on the correct air, air handling processes. We just actually, on Saturday, talked a group out of purchasing a huge system and really just do something very small. Uh, and so therefore, they can use their dollars in many other ways. So it's a really important, important part of what we're doing. Um, uh, now that we have this financial lifeline, we, we can also plan to offer expertise uh, for dollars for um, basically making Connecticut a healthier, healthier state for generations to come. We're going to all be able to go into these venues with a different mindset to know that we're safe. Um, all this will ensure not only success, long-term viability for these cultural institutions, but the arts sector as a whole and the tourism industry collectively. Recovery for arts, culture, tourism for our state is imperative as all of our state citizens are suffering from not only financial challenges, but perhaps more importantly, stress on their mental health and well-being. As the Shuttered Venues program pushes, begins to push the venues open, I look forward to the next phase of addressing financial needs of our other art artistic gems here in the state of Connecticut, those other artistic uh, economic drivers that we also hold so dear. We're a state extraordinarily wealthy in talent. We have numerous smaller, uh, uh, out-of-the-box creatives that don't yet fit in the Shuttered Venues guidelines. They're nimble and impactful service agencies with, which support these shuttered venues as well as individual artists that live, work, and invigorate our communities unas unassociated with these venues who also do not fit within the parameters. I look forward to seeing the impact of this incredible package and how we might broaden its scope in the near future. We've always known the impact of the arts are, are, are on mental health, economic prosperity, and quality of life. The loud statement that I think is being made today is really not only extraordinarily about finance, financial help from the state, but now it's actually going to help us with funders for the future. Now that the state has looked at it and said, and the, and the country has looked at the arts as such an important driver and infused all these dollars, now when we, when these fabulous folks behind me go out to talk to funders, they have yet another reason for folks to give. Uh, we, we really, I don't think, knew until it was gone that arts filled our hearts and our communities. And it's time for us to return to the arts, support the arts in their great service agencies, and make our state even stronger with and for the arts and the arts community. Thank you again, Congressman Courtney, for your extraordinary work on this amazing package for the arts in Connecticut. I know we're all going to make this state great again. Thanks. of the venue, is there a point at which in the past year you were concerned that you might not be able to open again? That's the first question. Second question is, to what extent do you need uh, support from equity, and what kind of support do you need to continue uh, towards the path of success? Um, I'll Sorry, I have to remember the pieces of that. Um, we, Goodspeed is going to reopen. That is not, you know, not reopening is not an option. Um, I think it is true that we may look different when we first return, um, and we will ask our audience's tolerance with that. Um, but Goodspeed is going to come back. We're going to come back strong. It won't happen overnight. It's not a light switch. 
Um, but but that is not in question. Um, I'm missing. There was a question in the middle. Of, We, we need we need the support of, of all the unions that we work with but um, I think we're getting what we need in terms of evolving um, guide, guidance for how to keep our artists and our audience safe together in performance um, it is evolving but I will say over the last week or so we've had a, a lot of communication with um, equity specifically about safety guidance that, that they are approving and rolling out vaccinated versus unvaccinated companies. So so they're working closely at this point with the, with the theaters, with producers to figure out a way to help us get all back to work. Jackie, would you agree with yeah, that? I, I would just like to add that at first it, their um, guidelines were kind of cookie cutter so that if you were a venue and had so many uh, capacity, then you all had to have the same uh, systems in place and I think now they're ha they have a little bit more ability to work with theaters individually so that um, maybe you can that you can open with um, a adjustments to your own system so you know I think the same as Donald and we, we're, we're feeling more hopeful this week that the union is uh, supporting and wants us to be open Joe, if I could ask, uh, can you hear me? Uh, how much of it is it? 15 billion or 16 billion in total tax? And how much of it is allocated to Connecticut? And are there restrictions on uh, what is the guidance on exactly what it can be used for? So uh, it is 16.2. Uh, I think is the final number. It was 16 because it was 15 in the in the December package, and then uh, another billion or so was added uh, with the rescue plan. Um, and there, there is no state-by-state state allocation. I mean, when this system opens up, it's like PPP. I mean, PPP was not, um, you know, Connecticut didn't get so much and New York got so much. I mean, it's going to be, um, you know, there, there's a limit, as Catherine said. You can't get more than $10 million. You know, can't go to an individual. And it's based on, I think, 45% of your gross revenue uh, from the... Yeah. Oh, there, I'm there for you. You're still here. Good. All right, good. I was looking for you the wrong way. So let me, yeah, Catherine can walk through what the... Uh, okay. <laughs> there we go. What, what, a, what a say. What a say. Um, so, so it is $16.2 billion. Um, and the, the grants are 45% of the gross earned revenue. There's almost 36 pages of frequently asked questions. Because as you can imagine, with all the different types of applicants, um, gross revenue, receipts, all is all very different. So it, there's very specific terms for every single type of applicant. There is a tiered system, a three-tiered system based on your loss. Um, and that is so that we make sure that the first grants go to those venues and eligible entities that are the hardest hit. The maximum loan amount is 10 million, but we do have a set aside for the smallest of the small. So for eligible applicants with 50 full-time employment, full-time employees, there is a $2 billion set aside. That is to make sure that they are um, able to be in um, uh, you know, in the queue as well. That's two billion of the sixteen. Correct. Billion. It's a set aside. Correct. The application op the application portal opens tomorrow. No matter what tier the eligible entity is in, they can put in their application, and the SBA Office of Disaster Assistance will um, will properly allocate the monies. So that's forty five percent. That's over what period, fiscal year, or? 2019 to 2020. Thank you. Yep. A couple things. Um, uh, for Captain Marks, uh, you, you said uh, you'd talk about the hardest hit, that the hardest hit institutions would get their relief from. What hardest hit mean? Is it the ones that close the longest or have the most employees? And also, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Courtney, could you 
Have you been at these institutions? I mean, have you been in the venues? Or could you speak? Could you speak of a show you see in there? What you're looking forward to seeing again? Um, so, yeah, um, Michael Price made sure that I visited um, <laughs> Good Speed Opera House over the years. And um, um, uh, I think it was Annie Get Your Gun maybe was, was here a number of years ago, my wife and I and, and family and, and other um, uh, venues. I've been to the Kate uh, for, uh, again, public events that have been held there a number of occasions. It is a community facility as well as an um, artistic community. And, um, and the... Um, Iverton, uh, again, is another one of these just, you know, community icons that um, you could never run for office if you hadn't been <laughs> over there to, uh, <laughs> to visit on numerous occasions. And, um, uh, you know, they're all just have their own story, which is quite unique. And, um, uh, and, and, and you know, so Connecticut really is blessed with a, with a very um, deep bench in terms of the arts. And that's why I think, you know, when we do the... Uh, uh, you know, after action report, Connecticut, I think we'll do quite well um, through the uh, Shuttered Venue Grant Program. And I'll yield the floor, as I said, okay. to uh, Catherine. Um, so first of all, I, I think there's a question based on what can you use it for. There's a whole series of eligible uses. Um, in terms of the hardest hit, that will be based on revenue loss. Thank you. And I, I don't believe you have any, I think Congressman answered all the other questions. First of all, I just want to thank you all for, for being here and doing so much for us. And I guess the question is a bit more abstract, a bit more opinion-based. I'm curious, you know, how do you think going forward the pandemic will shape the scene in CT politics and just how do you think we'll see more younger people being more or less interested because, like, you know, we've got a lot of good stuff done, but I think the overall kind of pessimism we've seen during this of just, you know, people feeling that kind of hopelessness, but also feeling like, you know that, like, like I said, there's been good, a lot of good stuff done. Do you think that will kind of inspire the youth and in kind of going forward the way that you know you look back at you know think Great Depression or World War II, or do you think that we'll kind of be in a stage of, at least for a little bit, of that kind of overall pessimism? So I'm I'm bullish on the fact that uh, first of all, and it's because if you look at um, last November, and I see State Senator Needleman here, and he can attest to this. Um, you know, we shattered all records for voter turnout. There were, I think, 372,000 people voted in the second congressional district. I've been in a few of those elections. <laughs> this thing, this thing just blew up um, the, the numbers. And there's no question that the 18 to 30 year old uh, turnout uh, again also broke all records, which has been, frankly, a that's demographic fixed. that's always sort that's of fixed. trailed in, in the past. So, um, so that's number one. And number two, I think, frankly. The, the, the question of will people stay engaged, I mean, the fact that we passed the rescue plan, you know, within less than 50 days, um, again, a, a, um, a, a plan that touches people in so many ways, whether it's the income, you know, the economic impact payments, uh, unemployment extension, you know, helping uh, local school systems, helping uh, higher education, who, um, again, I think is going to certainly reach that younger um, demographic and, and, and population. Uh, but we've got more work to do, and that's why, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the infrastructure bill that the president's out talking about today, and, you know, I was at on NPR this morning, and, you know, we, we, people are still, you know, know that we, um, we've got more work to do for this country, and I think young people in particular um, are still, you know, going to be a, a, a group that, I, and I think it's great, yeah, you know, are yeah. going to be demanding. I don't want to thank you for, for yeah. putting in that work. Right. That you, no. you know, you got a yeah. lot left, but thank no, you so exactly. much for all that no, you've there's done. There's more meat left on the bone. So. <laughs> well, you've gotten to a lot of it. That's what's yes. for right. it. Right. Any other questions? All right. Thank Good. you for that. All right. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. Okay. Please stay safe. Thank you.